Welcome back to our program, Health, Wellbeing and Lifestyle, where we invite professionals in their fields to come along and educate and inspire the community to live more healthily, feel more balanced and truly live a lifestyle they love. Our first guest is Dr. Zara Chelik, our integrative health and wellness expert. And she's back with us today to talk about eliminating fatigue. So welcome, Zara. Thank you. Is, is fatigue actually feeling tired? Uh, it's actually more than that. So uh, usually with fatigue, you know, tiredness is you can get enough sleep and it can resolve itself. With fatigue, however, that's not necessarily is the case. Uh, when someone experiences fatigue, it can indicate and give a message, convey a message about something you know, deeper than tiredness going on in the body, something more significant going on in the body. Um, you know, it could be from a hormonal uh, issue such as uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis uh, dysfunction. Uh, it is like an orchestra, right? The hormonal, you know, hormones communicate but like an orchestra. And if something's out of whack, the whole orchestra doesn't sound quite great. Uh, so it's similar to that, you know, um, so the hormones communicate in a nice um, orchestra, uh, if you like. And when there is a disruption in that, uh, and that disruption is like the hypothalamic pituitary axis dysfunction, uh, and there's also adrenals in there as well. So um, the really correct name for that is hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis dysfunction. Uh, and that can usually come along with chronic um, and uh, long-term stress, for example. Uh, especially if the stress has been there for a long time, it could be a trauma, again, a perceived trauma. Uh, and it can be initiated from there. And if it is not resolved, it can lead to more health issues. So we want to make sure and uh, let our viewers know that when you are experiencing something more than tiredness, and doesn't matter how much sleep you're getting, you're still not feeling quite right, the energy is less or depleted, then... Um, consult your healthcare practitioner, get help. Uh, get help where, we, you, know, where uh, you get to find that exactly the root cause of your fatigue. It could be that hormonal factor, it could be an iron deficiency, it could be more. Uh, it could be also that person is not enjoying life. Again, that whole perceived, you know, feeling the state of depression. Would that be like chronic fatigue or what's called, termed chronic fatigue? Yeah, so usually in our, you know, in our society, people refer to it as chronic fatigue. Absolutely, you're right. But the um, correct terminology for it is really, it's a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis dysfunction. So it's a dysfunction in our communication of the hormones. So uh, it can usually happen uh, and come on with maybe a perceived trauma or high stress levels can lead to the interruption of the flow of energy in the cells, within the cells, and in this case, um, in the endocrine system. So, uh, you know, stress is chronic and it hasn't been attended and it hasn't been resolved. It can lead to that chronic fatigue. So the individual can feel really that lack of energy, that fatigue, and they can usually stimulate themselves with you know, stimulants such as sugar or caffeine or uh, sugary drinks uh, and so forth to really push themselves to get through the day or start their day. The, the only problem with that though, we can push our adrenals to a limit where they're not able to produce that cortisol and adrenaline to, re you know, when we need it most, which is in a stressful, real threat situations. I find with the modern world, particularly, um, the, with the language that we associate with our day-to-day -day tasks can create that internal sort of language and internal biochemistry can adapt to it and the hormones can be interrupted that way and the communication in the hormones can be altered and then can, that can lead to a stress as well. So uh, I find in the modern world, again, um, things are on the go, go, go. Multiple screens going on. Uh, people put so much pressure on themselves and there's also pressure, it's expected externally as well. So people trying to really please and fit in and meet deadlines, right? So they can really push themselves. And to really get through the day, they can go to the stimulants and have the caffeine, have the sugar, you know, to really get the tasks complete, right? Um, what, what happens though, 
the whole physiology is giving feedback to us and we're ignoring it. Uh, so the biochemistry is not functioning well and the physiology is giving feedback to let us know through fatigue that things are not doing well in the body. So rather than listening to the body's needs, we tend to go to those stimulants and to push ourselves to produce the deadline. But down the track, it can have more significant uh, impact on our health and well-being and our energy levels. So I encourage people, once they know they fatigue and they're not, you know, they don't have the energy they used to, to really stop and pay attention to the body and the symptoms, because symptoms is the way body communicating to us to let us know something isn't right. So once we know we are fatigued or we're not producing that outcome or the energy isn't the same, go deeper. What, is, what has changed? What can you do to support the body? Because it is telling you, it's giving you a message. What can you do to support that whole HPA axis dysfunction and reverse that as soon as you can because it becomes a bigger problem in the future. So certain things could be such as, you know, lifestyle factors play a big role. Uh, remember I talked about the whole perceived stress or the language that we use and we create that internal stress. Cool the individual work on that. Instead of saying, I have to, can we use more of the I get to's uh, and have more gratitude around things that we do day to day. So, Sarah, if there was a, a couple of simple tips that the viewers could take with them today, then what would they be? Yeah, sure. So, you know, it's something simple as our lifestyle, you know, uh, one of them could be drinking enough water, enough hydration for our cells. So our cells are looking more like grapes, not like sultanas. So the other thing is starting our day. Uh, instead of starting a day with a coffee or caffeine, uh, could we instead invest in our health and well-being and make a nice smoothie that is not sugar-based? Uh, can we go to bed earlier? and have that enough sleep because sleep is really what helps our body to heal itself by itself and get that balance into the body again. So these are the certain things we can start implementing our sleep and having a nice sleep ritual, having good time, you know, a good bedtime ritual to have that quality sleep. Switching our electronics uh, earlier, maybe like two hours say earlier than we go to bed to take some time to, you know, get into our body, connect with the body and also give to reward ourselves with something before we go to bed. Create that nice environment in your bedroom where it is inviting, it is calming, it is grounding. So that could be another thing that could really help our audience to, that yeah, anyone's experiencing fatigue, to really invest and reverse or even just boost our energy levels in general. That sleep is crucial. Thank you for that. My pleasure. And for more information on Dr. Zara Chilek and eliminating fatigue, then please go to her webpage on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. Dr. Zara will be back next time with us talking about stress management. Now we'll go to break and be back after the break with more amazing guests and topics. Welcome back and next we have Mark Carrazzo, our business consultant and coach and as part of the positive psychology series he's talking to us today about the importance of meaning. Welcome Matt, Mark. Welcome Linda. Yeah so what, what, do, what does this mean? The me what do you mean by the meaning of life? Well by the meaning of life I, I'm not talking about the deeply philosophical question of, of what is the meaning of our lives. I'm talking about something larger in our lives than ourselves which gives us purpose and motivation. Uh, it's a very important concept, it's been proven to be so and it's unique to every individual. So it's the thing that drives us every, every day, Linda. And why is finding meaning so important? Well it gives us our drive and, and motivation in life. It's uh, a set of goals for us, something that we can measure our life by every now and then and of course when we achieve certain steps on the road to our goal, we feel a sense of accomplishment. Now, so far as, as the research suggests, uh, if we've got people that are in the later stages of their life, we find that they're more likely to live longer if they've got a sense of meaning and purpose. And, and we also know that people that have meaning and purpose in life are generally happier, have better well-being, 
uh, better physical and mental health and are less likely to suffer from depression. So meaning is really one of the very most important pillars in the positive psychology area. And, and one particular person whose work in this area I respect is an Australian psychiatrist and neurologist called Viktor Frankl. He's also uh, a Holocaust survivor and he believes a firm sense of meaning is absolutely essential to human flourishing and, and he used meaning uh, in order to motivate people around him going through the very distressing circumstances that are really hard to imagine for anybody it, uh, through the Holocaust. He motivated people to want to live on by reminding them or pointing to their purpose and meaning in life. So he's very, very well equipped to talk about the importance of meaning, Linda. And so would that change through, a, through our lives? Yeah, I think, our, I think the meaning of our, uh, of our life or our purpose changes uh, throughout the course of our lives. Uh, it, it, I know for, for many people, the, having children is a classic example of where their focus and attention might change. Uh, there's the other people out there whose purpose of life might be to assist with the environment or to leave the world in a better place. Other people find meaning from, from religions and, and, and formal faiths and observances like that. But yes, it does change through the course of our lives. And if you don't find meaning during your life, can that, what can you do about it? It's a hard question. I think some of us forget to really contemplate what the meaning or purpose of our lives would be. So the first thing I'd say is to do that. If you're not getting anywhere with that, I'd go back to the other basic important pillars leading to well-being, which are connection and relationships. I'd focus on them. I'd focus on acts, acts of kindness, uh, maybe volunteering some sort of social benefit from what you're doing with your life. So uh, engagement in activities is also very important. Find something that you enjoy doing and get yourself immersed in that. And I tend to suspect that uh, eventually meaning or purpose will, will reveal itself whilst you're doing those processes, Linda. And um, what about um, during your work or other routine things? How would, how would you find meaning during those times? It's really important that we find meaning in what we do. In fact, uh, the evidence out there suggests that people that can find some sort of social benefit in what they're doing or something within their work that they care for perform a lot better. So uh, I think we need to look at our work and look at what the ultimate outcome is of what we do to find where we find some relevance to it. People like that who see their work as a calling perform better, uh, enjoy their work more and obviously enhance their whole life. So yes, we can get meaning out of work and, and we should. And it's also worth considering what we get out of the mundane tasks we do at home. We might view something uh, as simple as, as washing the dishes or vacuuming as fairly unimportant work. But if we look at it in the context of what it's doing to ensure a happy household, then we're obviously going to feel more satisfied while we do it and, and perform it better when we do it. And there is a bit of research done on hospital cleaners. The first group of hospital cleaners saw their work as, as lowly skilled and unimportant. The second group, the ones that perform better, saw their work as something that bettered the lives of patients and medical staff. So it's sometimes changing the way you see things and the, and the things you see will change. So that's very important in, in finding meaning. And, and how would finding meaning help in relationships in your life? Well, I think when you're doing something that you enjoy doing, uh, you're going to obviously put a lot of energy into it. You're going to find people of the same interests of you. So you've got that bond before it starts. So finding meaning in what you want to do and getting involved in activities that involve other people is going to impliedly enhance a lot of your relationships and connectedness, Linda. And would there be any more tips that you could give our viewers? No, just, just that. I think uh, start with, start with the, the basics of, of what we believe is important for wellbeing. Look to relationships, look to engagement, look to kindness and care and also try to look at what you're doing and work through the processes until you find some meaning in it for others and that will give you the start of a sense of purpose. You'll be back next week to talk to us more about relationships. Uh, so for more about Mark Carazzo and the meaning of life, then please go to our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au.
welcome back. And now we have Pauline Rooney back with us, our Yoga for Wellbeing instructor and author. And today she's talking about sleep deprivation. So Pauline, welcome back. Thanks, Linda. And how does sleep deprivation affect our wellbeing? Linda, it's absolutely amazing. It's huge. And I don't think people understand it as what it is. Sometimes we toss and turn and we say, oh, we've had a bad night's sleep, didn't get a good sleep, etc. all those types of things, but not realising the effect that it actually does have on us. And I'm sure many of us, your viewers, have woken up in the morning and felt as though you haven't even had a night's sleep. And that can affect our work, so we're not switched on, so to speak. It can affect the thought process, it can affect our moods, it can affect our eating, because sometimes if we haven't had that good night's sleep, we think we feel a little grumpy, so we go to the comfort foods, and that does not help. We're better off to take charge of the night's sleep. And there's such things as when we get into bed, saying to ourselves, I'm going to sleep comfortably all night, and program the mind to know that it is sleep time. Instead of going to bed and saying, oh, I never sleep, I bet I don't sleep tonight, you're programming the thought process not to sleep. So when you're hopping to bed, there's a couple of things that I like to do. I like to pop my hands on my chest and just give a couple of thank yous for what I've done through the day. That's a really nice end of day. It can be anything you like. And if you do wake up in the night, don't lie there and arguing with yourself. Do something to really make you feel comfortable and want to go back to sleep. So you might do seven rounds of beautiful breathing and you really focus on the breath, nothing else, focus on the breath. If you wanted to, you could visualize a, a lovely blue color coming in and out of your nostrils. You could, I always say, you could just lie there and play. It's better than having an argument. And so you focus on your breathing, you might want to uh, do a couple of little gentle exercises in the yoga. Uh, that's okay too. Lift your arm, raise your leg, bend your knees, those types of things. But breathing, turn your pillow over so you've got that lovely cool underneath you again. There's just so many ways in order to get your mind back on track that it is time to sleep. The other thing is, the moon can have an effect, Linda, and sometimes the moon will wake us, right? And therefore, if it is a full moon, we can take the time to go, isn't this a magic time? And really embrace that in preference of, oh, the moon's full and I can't go to sleep. So stop the blame and take charge. And the breath, the posture, the pillow turning, all those types of things are massive. It really is a large problem. And the other thing, Linda, I'm not sure how many people are aware of the children that are not sleeping. And there's so much pressure on our children today. They've got to perform at school. They've got to be good at sport. They've, just the pressures. And it's a really big problem. So instead of putting the children to bed and saying, you better sleep tonight, or please sleep tonight. It's, you have a lovely, comfy, snuggly sleep. And sometimes you can say to them, lay there and feel really uncomfortable. You know, if you don't like sleeping on your back, lie on your back until you had enough. And then you curl over to your comfy side and it's, ah, so lovely. You want to go to sleep and you do go to sleep. So it's taking the action of feeling fabulous about going to sleep. And it does help. It changes our moods. As I started with, the sleep deprivation can make us grumpy, not think. It's interesting that research shows that sleep deprivation and driving is almost as bad as drink driving. You're totally impaired driving under the influence of sleep deprivation. And there's an incredible amount of research under that. In fact, 
some of the cars of today, Linda, a bit spooky, but you'll be driving along and they'll say, sleep, uh, you've been driving X number of hours, it's time to pull over and rest, or your eyes are tired. Uh, uh, there's a, it's amazing technology and that's a great help. But we need to take the charge. We need to get into that bed with the love of the sleep, love of being asleep and staying asleep and breathing. And as I say, embracing it if you wake up and think about, I can do a couple of post yoga postures. I can do my beautiful breathing instead of going, I can't sleep and going with the fight. I call it a fight, an argument with one's own self, you know, whatever. But get into the habit of saying to yourself, tonight is my gorgeous night's sleep. I have X number of hours. The other thing is, don't go to bed when you're really tired. That's a big mistake. We tend to wait till we're very tired. You then are almost hitting the overtired. So you can get into bed and I'm wide awake. It's because you're overtired. So many of us, because of our work time, we eat too late. We just have a little snack with the cupper at nine, ten o'clock. No, we should have our intake well before then. Because the system is digesting, of course, and as it's digesting, we're saying, excuse me, I want to sleep. It's got a job to do too. It's better to do it while you're awake and setting up instead of doing it when you're resting. You know, it's time to rejuvenate. As a, as a really uh, the top thing for today, mm -hmm. out of all those amazing tips that you've just given, what would you say to our viewers? I think some yoga posture is always very good because it just slows you down, takes out the stress of the day. And Linda, that can be as simple as doing a little turn in your chair, right? Just as simple as that. And you go both ways. You might want to do uh, uh, some work on the floor, uh, po yoga postures on the floor. That's okay. It doesn't matter. It's to separate day preparation for sleep. And if we can do that, we do sleep a lot better. Really, we do. So a little yoga, a little meditation, a little breathing, and most important, don't argue with yourself should you wake up. Just embrace it, love it, and go back to sleep. Great. Well, that's a wonderful way to end our program. Thank you, Pauline. So for more information on Pauline Rooney and sleep deprivation, then please go to her webpage on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. And now we'll finish the show and see you next week.